Welkom bij de nieuwe wereld. Mijn naam is Marley Stekkers en mijn gast vandaag is Gary Taubes. Gary, welkom. Marley, thank you for having me. Yes, we go to do it in English because you are coming from the States. Okay. And um, you have jet lag, I think, a bit. And probably. <laughs> yeah. or we forgive you. Life lag. <laughs> But welcome. Uh, you are here because of the Ancestral Health Conference. They invite you. Yes, I'll be speaking tomorrow. Well, Saturday. What yeah. day is today? That's a sign of jet lag. Friday. I'll be speaking tomorrow at the Ancestral yeah. Health Symposium. Yeah. You are a big hotshot, so I know you very well. I speak here many times about you because you are kind of the guru of these topics. So um, I think why we get fat and what we do about it. It's a New York Times bestsellers. Good calories, bad calories, the diet illusion, the case for keto. That are a few of your books. I have the them here. The case against sugar. The, yeah. And I think if we have to say what is the, the heart of the matter is sugar. Sugar and refined carbs. So the heart of the matter is, for the past 100 years, in the past 50 years, we've embraced a couple of uh, sort of dogmatic uh, assumptions about nutrition and health and the relationship between what we eat and chronic diseases. Uh, one is, the primary one is that we get fat because we eat too much. And tagged on to that in beginning in the 1950s is this idea that we get heart disease because of the saturated fat in our diet and so we should eat a low fat diet or a diet that's low in saturated fat like the Mediterranean diet and that this will prevent heart disease and I entered this field as a journalist and an investigative journalist and I was curious and I started looking for evidence First is a series of investigative articles for the journal Science, and um, when you start going to look for compelling evidence for why we believe these things, it, they're very hard to find. So that led me down a rabbit hole, and these four books. These books. And, yeah. So if, just to introduce you a bit, you graduate from the Harvard College in 1977, BS. Yeah. So science backgrounds and Stanford and Columbia University, you yeah. won enormous uh, amount of awards. And you know, if you live, if you work long enough as a journalist, <laughs> then you don't. There's something seriously wrong with your product. <laughs> um, and then that you gave that interview in the New York Times magazine, 2002. That was an article I wrote. Yeah, and that was a big shift, I think. Yeah, that was the sort of beginning of all this. So I had done. These two investigations for science on uh, the question of, again, on sort of fundamental beliefs about nutrition. So that the idea that high blood pressure, hypertension is caused by eating too much salt. And the evidence for that, much to my surprise, was poor. And in fact, it was a, an interesting hypothesis that was tested and it failed the tests. And then the public health community said we should believe it anyway. They still do. Um, that led me into the dietary fat story. Does fat cause heart disease? And the evidence for that was poor. Again, interesting hypothesis. They tested in clinical trials. It fails the test. But by that time, we've invested so much money and effort and that we, in effect, the researchers and the public health authorities had to believe it anyway. So that's what they told us. And then this 2002 article in the New York Times Magazine was called What If It's Been a Big Fat Lie or What If Fat Doesn't Make You Fat? And it started looking at the science behind fat accumulation and obesity. And the conventional wisdom at that point was that we get fat because we eat too much fat. And yeah. the evidence suggested that we get fat because we eat carbohydrates. So, and in When I was growing up, until the 1960s, the conventional wisdom was that carbohydrates were fattening. That's what my mother's generation believed. You know, beer and the beer belly. Yeah. Sweets, you eat too much sweets, you get fat, and then rice, pasta, bread. You know, the idea was any woman who wanted to keep her figure didn't eat those foods. And then we 
decided dietary fat causes heart disease, and so if you can't eat fat, you have to eat carbs, and carbs went from being something that were considered inherently fattening to a heart-healthy diet food. And now all the people who were struggling to maintain a healthy weight were told to eat precisely the diet that will make matters worse. And this coincides with an obesity epidemic. And a, where we are right and now. Where we are right now, yeah. The whole world getting ever fatter and more diabetic. And So there has to become somewhere an enlightenment from we are wrong. Well, that's what you would think. Yeah. You know, the, when I give these lectures, I mentioned I was lecturing in, at the University of Copenhagen on Wednesday. I start off by saying, look, here's a, the obesity and the diabetes epidemic. One of my favorite lectures was from Margaret Chan, who was the director general of the World Health Organization. And in 2016, she gave this talk in Washington, D.C., and she described the obesity and diabetes epidemics as a slow-motion disaster. And then she gave the, her estimate for the probability that we'll be able to control these epidemics, not reverse them. So control not, them. Just stop them from getting worse. worse. As way free phases to prevent the bad situation from getting worse. And her estimate that organizations like that WHO would succeed at this was virtually zero likelihood. So under a circumstance like that where the world's most influential health officer is predicting not just failure in the present, but complete failure in the future, you would think that governments would get together and say, look, maybe, maybe we misunderstand the problem here. Like if this were HIV, were AIDS, and after identifying the HIV virus as a cause of AIDS, the mortality from AIDS continued to go up and up. And 40 years later, 30% of the population were dying from AIDS, we would say, maybe it's not the HIV virus. Because if it was, we'd have succeeded in bringing it on. You know, the same with lung cancer and cigarettes. But in this world, what we do is, as we undergo ever more and greater and greater failure, we blame the food industry. We blame all manner of forces in society that then we ultimately blame the people suffering for not being able to control their appetites. And never does anyone say, why don't we put together an investigative committee of really thoughtful individuals, good scientists, and let's, you know, examine our fundamental beliefs about this because maybe the failure is due to not to how people take the advice we're giving, but to the underlying ideas. And so journalists like myself, there's a few of us out there who have actually said, you know, I'm going to give this a try. <laughs> I'm going to see if what we think we believe is really true, and it's very easy to find out. That yeah, it's but fun. you have a, a science background. I did have a science background. And I think background. that helps a lot. Well, I go also... through really what what is... What is the science really tell us? It's more than just a science background, because all science journalists have a science background. Most science journalists have a science background. My first books were about first high-energy physicists and then nuclear physicists and chemists who discovered non-existent phenomena. So basically, it was about very, very smart scientists who screwed up. Um... Can I use scatological language on this show? Yeah. <laughs> okay. The more the non-technical term would be they fucked up. Yeah. Okay. They discovered things that didn't exist, and then other scientists had to step in to show them how they had screwed up. And that was my learning. My second book, which was about uh, something called cold fusion, which was the famous scientific fiasco of the 1980s and 90s. Um, it was called Bad Science. And the learning process was that it's... Uh, screwing up in science is about the easiest thing you could do and the most likely result of any scientific endeavor. So you basically learn how you screwed up. Um, so I recognized I had studied bad science my whole professional career, and I would like to think all of my books, despite being about nutrition, are about good science and bad science. And so that was my background going in. I think I can recognize bad science when I see it. My critics would say I see bad science everywhere, whether it's there or not, and they could be right, so, you know. 
But we, we have to keep each other sharp. Yes. <laughs> that is, that's the real science. Okay, but we are in that big um, way of thinking about uh, calorie in, calorie out. Right. And the energy balance thing. Um, so can you give your idea, because a whole book of you is going about that. So yeah. what okay. is the wrong perception of that? Because... Even in hospitals, they still say that also here in the Netherlands. So oh, we'll go to the WHO, the World Health Organization website, and look up obesity and overweight, and they'll say the fundamental cause is taking in more calories than you expend. This is the the fundamental dogma. The, what's the word that um, the sort of prime dogma of all of nutrition science? And it, it infiltrates all science because when you get into uh, heart disease and, and any other and they start talking about the why these diseases associate with obesity, it always comes down ultimately to this idea that you take in more energy than you expend. So, um, and it's what I believed when I started my research. It just seemed obvious. You eat too much. The, yeah, you have to sport more and eat less. Yeah, and the biblical terms are gluttony and sloth, right? You're physically inactive, you, you know. Um, I... Again, when I started doing my research, it was I was a lucky time in history because the internet had come along, and suddenly you could locate virtually every primary source going back to the 19th century. Now you can download it. In the early 2000s, I could get references and citations, and I had students working at various libraries around the country who would go to the medical school libraries and Xerox 50 articles for them and ship for me and ship them off. But Going back in time, you find that prior to World War II, there were competing hypotheses of obesity. So one was that it's a hormonal, constitutional problem. Some people are born predisposed to get fat, and they do, and they can starve themselves, and they'll still be fatter than thin people. They'll just be sort of emaciated fat people. Um, and then the other hypothesis was say too much because the world was full of the example I use is Falstaff from Shakespeare, right? Big, heavy, hefty guy with these huge appetites and he's always eating and drinking. And so you assume that because they're eating that much, that's what's causing the obesity. Although the flip side would say Falstaff was born predisposed to become obese and because his body was trying to become so big, he was hungrier and thirstier than everyone else and hence... So you can explain any observation with either hypothesis. And the first one was coming for hormone uh, was coming from Germany, isn't from it? From German and uh, so pre-war prior to, well, there really was no such thing as American medical science in the 19th century. We were a backwater. You could get into medical school. If you had a high school education, you could get into medical school. And usually if you could pay for it, you could get into medical school and become a doctor. Um, America starts to develop a sort of European system for medical science in the 1890s with the founding of John Hopkins University. Um, and then we do some good work during the first flu epidemic, primarily in, in infectious disease. But other than that, Americans are backwaters. And Americans who study, want to do medical science, go to Germany and Austria, where medical science had reached sort of apex. And you study with the hair professor doctors who run these institutes. And um, any physician who wanted to do serious medical science had to at least be able to read German and ideally could speak German so he could go study in Germany or Austria. So their theory was it's constitutional. In fact, they thought it's absurd that you should think that people get fat just because they eat too much. And in a lot of different reasons, you know, um, like fat accumulation differs by sex, right? So men fatten differently than women, and we fatten in different places, and that tells you that sex hormones are involved. And, you know, boys and girls fatten differently, and um, there are localized fat deposits called lipomas, which are like fatty tumors, and there are places in your body where you just don't accumulate fat. Like, we don't get fat on our foreheads, mm -hmm. no matter how fat the rest of our bodies might be. So clearly there are local factors that determine how fat certain parts of your body are going to get. Why wouldn't you assume that these factors are working in general when people get too fat? And they're independent. Like if you have a fatty tumor, that's independent of how much you eat. 
You know, if two kids go through puberty, a boy loses fat and gains muscle, and a girl gains fat and gains fat in very specific places to make, give her a womanly shape, that's independent of how much they're eating. You know, it's just, it's always independent of how much they're eating. And when they started creating animal models of obesity, they found out that the animals would get fat even when half starved. So you could do these experiments where you, you have this, uh, there's a, genetic model that was uh, first identified in 1950, famous model called the OBOB mouse, and these little balls of fat, these mutants. Um, you start, you, you, you take a lean mouse that doesn't have this mutation, you measure how much food it eats from day to day, you cut that amount in half, so you're literally gonna semi-starve, and that's what you give the obese mutant, and it becomes obese anyway. Yeah. Okay, it's got nothing to do with how much they're eating. This animal is driven to accumulate massive amounts of fat. So the Germans, that was their theory. There was one American, a guy named Louis Newberg at the University of Michigan, who was convinced, that decided that he had proven experimentally that the obesity was always caused by overeating. I mean, in retrospect, it was a crazy claim and a crazy experiment, but... He believed it, and he argued and it seemed scientific to all these doctors because they didn't know what science really was. So <laughs> this guy said he had done an experiment. It's your he said he, I'm happy that you say it. <laughs> anyway, World War II comes along. The Germans yeah. and Austrians vanish. The constitutional hypothesis vanishes. The animal experiments continue to show the same thing. Any animal model of obesity, you starve the animal, it's going to get fat anyway. It's got nothing to do with it. I mean, they'll get fatter if you let it eat, just like... You can starve a child and inhibit its growth. And you know, during famines, kids' growth are stunted. And when their famine ends, they have something called catch-up growth, where they, you know, so you have the same phenomenon with these animals. You could starve it and inhibit the obesity, but then let it feed freely, it'll get more. You know, in America, by the 1950s, um, the leading theories of obesity were trying to explain food regulation, like this guy Newberg had said, people get fat because they eat too much. Um, scientists started trying to explain why fat people might eat too much. So the theories, one was called the glucostat, one called the lipostat, were theories of why people who suffer from obesity might eat too much. They weren't theories of why they might accumulate too much fat. They were theories. It's the, and it's all very clear in the science. I mean, I would like to think that if anyone in the establishment cared enough to replicate my research, I reference everything like you're yeah. supposed to, that they would go back and find a very similar story. They might try hard to spin it so it agrees with their preconceptions, but they'll have it'll be difficult. So anyway, that's it. By the 1960s, the leading authorities on obesity are psychologists trying to. <clears throat> and the Europeans have just, you guys have just been out of it, okay? Because first there's World War II, then there's a recovery from war where you're not worried about obesity, you're worried about hunger. famine and hunger. And, um, so all of this is dominated by these basically naive American doctors who think they can do science and don't have any real conception of what it takes to do good science. And it's just... Um, now we it's, have here the slogan after World War II, and never uh, hungry again. Yeah. Well, this is well, one of the interesting things. So obesity tends to associate with poverty in affluent countries um, and even in third world countries to some extent. So in the late 1960s, the U.S. Congress has hearings on hunger in America, these famous series of hearings. And um, there's a point at which one of the congressmen involved in the hearings turns to George McGovern, the running the hearings and says, George, we're doing hearings on hunger in America and poverty and everyone we're interviewing is obese. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but they don't stop to think that maybe this tells them that there's something about obesity and, and the type of food being consumed. So, you know, the end story of this the Americans decide that obesity is caused by eating too much. And so all obesity science is aimed at trying to figure out why people eat too much. 
Meanwhile, there's a science of fat metabolism and fat storage. So one way to think of it is adiposity versus obesity, or the, the science of fat storage versus the science of excess fat storage. So the excess fat storage, people are trying to figure out why people eat too much, and they're psychologists. And the people studying fat storage, which is, by the way, a science that's begun by German emigre biochemists who have been you know, run out of, they've fled Europe because of Hitler and the Nazis and have settled either in Tel Aviv or in New York. Very, very smart guys. They invent these new technologies so you could study how macronutrients, carbohydrates, protein, and fat, how they, after you eat them, what the body does with them. Which is that the insulin? Insulin ends up being, they, you can't measure insulin yet, but insulin ends up being a major player. So the science of fat metabolism, by the 1940s, it's clear that we store fat independent of how much we eat. We're always storing fat and mobilizing fat and burning fat, and that's not controlled by how much we eat. It's controlled by hormones that are secreted in response to the different macronutrients, but they can't measure hormones in the blood, so they can't really nail that down. Um, so they can only at that moment measure energy levels and well, the hormone, hormone levels, that's later. You can measure what's happening to the food. So this German emigre, Rudolf Schoenheimer, brilliant man who would have won the Nobel Prize had he lived, which he didn't, he committed suicide in 1941. Um, I could imagine why he was so depressed. Um, he discovered, he came to the U.S. and he was working at the laboratory of a fellow named Harold Urey who had discovered this radioactive isotope of hydrogen called deuterium. So hydrogen is a proton and a neutron and deuterium is, oh, I'm going to get this wrong, Jesus. I can't help you. <laughs> this, I'm going to beg jet lag, you know, proton and two neutrons. Um, but you could tag, you could make food, so hydrocarbon, a carbohydrate has hydrogen, car carbon, and oxygen, so you could use deuterium instead of hydrogen and make carbohydrate and then feed it to animals, and you could see where the radioactivity accumulates in the animals. You could sacrifice it like an hour after eating, a day after eating, a week, and you could see where the radioactivity ends up, so you could see the end product in this sort of black box of where the foods end up. That's a, the best you could do when they, they develop different radioactive markers and different ways to do it, and it got more and more sophisticated. But the message was we're constantly storing fat and mobilizing fat and burning fat, and it's circulating through our body. It's not this passive receptacle where it just goes because you've eaten too much and it's staying there. And by the mid-1950s, three groups of research, sciences moved forward when people create new measuring technologies. You could see something new or measure something new, and it gives you new insight into your problem. So scientists create a technique to measure fatty acids in the bloodstream, which is the form, one form in which fat circulates in the blood. And then in 1960, you can finally measure hormones in the bloodstream. Uh, invention called the radium you know, assay that won one of the researchers, Rosalind Yallo, the Nobel Prize, and suddenly you could measure hormones and it becomes completely clear that fat accumulation, fat storage is being dominated by the hormone insulin. All the other hormones tend to mobilize fat from your fat tissue because they're telling your body to do something, you know, procreate, eat, flee, fight, and they make the fuel available for that to happen. Like one of the experiments was you inject adrenaline into, some, into an animal's body and it dumps fat into your fat tissue. And the idea is if you're confronted with a lion and you've got to run from the lion... You need a lot of energy. You need energy <laughs> to keep running and the <laughs> hormones make it. Insulin works the opposite. Insulin works to store calories as fat. It tells the rest of the body to use glucose, carbohydrates, as fuel. So you eat a mixed meal, your body um, secretes, uh, you know, it's got carbohydrates, protein, and fat, and the carbohydrates break down to glucose, they go into your bloodstream, and your blood sugar starts going up. And high blood sugar is kind of toxic to cells. 
So you secrete insulin, which tells your cells to burn the blood sugar because it wants to keep blood sugar down. But you don't want your cells doing anything else but burning blood sugar, so it tells fat to be stored. So it's like we're going to hold on to the fat and we're going to burn the carbs. And then when we're done burning the carbs, we'll let the fat out of the fat tissue and now we can burn the fat. Now you can run even further from the lion. All this is very clear by the mid-1960s, yeah. and we secrete insulin primarily to the carbohydrates in our diet. So for 150 years, we've had this theory that carbohydrates are fattening, and by the 1960s, we actually understand why they would be fattening. And by that time, we believe that dietary fat causes heart disease, and that people get fat because they eat too much. That's what the psychologists are telling us. So this science just never really goes anywhere. It just sits there. Insulin, carbohydrates drive insulin, drive fat accumulation. That's how it was described to me by one of the researchers who did the work in the 60s. Um, so the nutritionist, dietitians, one of the lines I quote in most of my books was from a British Journal of Nutrition article in 1963, and the first sentence was, every woman believes, knows that carbohydrates are fattening. You know, now we know why. Yep. It's irrelevant. Now we're going to tell people to avoid fat. They should eat carbohydrates. So the whole the food pyramid, the food pyramid is then, at that time, then be becomes... The, the biggest thing, what you have to eat, seven is to carbs. eleven servings a day of yeah. all the foods that are going to make you fat. If you happen to be one of these people who is predisposed, constitutional predisposition to get fat. So, um, what happened is tragic. It's really tragic. It is really tragic. They, all hospitals all over the world. I just say something, 80% of our illness are coming from, because we, we see this wrong. Yeah, yeah. No, it's diabetes, it's so uh, heart diseases, um, even fat liver. cancer and dementia. And so this is a whole cluster of diseases. This was another stream of research. So one thing I could do as a journalist, a scientist, a medical scientist tend not to do. So I could go from... Um, Discipline to discipline. I'm not locked into a discipline. I'm not somebody who's trying to keep up with the 30 journals that are published in my discipline every week. I can call people up. I don't have to read the papers. I did. But once I read the papers, I could call them up and interview them and ask them. So scientists will never call up another scientist and say, hey, Joe, can you explain to me why you said this in this paper? It makes no sense. They should. And if they're friends, they might. But I could. I interviewed 600 people for this one book, Good Calories, Bad Calories. Um, and I can move from discipline to discipline. I could follow the references. So if somebody referenced an article, I pulled that article. If they referenced the book, I bought the book. You could by 2002, you could buy virtually every used bookstore had their their list online. Um, the uh, there had been a very common observation that had come out of beginning in the 1890s that chronic diseases are diseases of Western diets and lifestyles. So missionary and colonial physicians all around the world would be writing these little reports saying, you know, I've been working in, uh, well, uh, Albert Schweitzer said this about uh, the French Equatorial Africa, where he had his um, missionary hospital that won him the Nobel Prize, and he said, you know, he got there in 1913, I think it was, and he saw, Christ, hundreds of patients a week, and it was like 35 years before he ever saw a case of appendicitis in an African child, and 20 years before he saw a case of cancer in an African. And meanwhile, he was treating them in the local whites who were eating differently. So there was this, this observation that certain diseases appear with Western diets and lifestyles. And in the 1960s, already researchers were saying, British research saying, when we add sugar and white flour, to any population's diet, you eventually see this explosion of obesity, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, dementia. Um, 
the problem with observations like that is you can always explain it as, well, if they're not eating Western diets, they probably don't have Western doctors around to diagnose them. And many of these, like some of the early cases of cancer that were reported were like, you know, epithelioma of the penis. And you could imagine that these people, if they got a cancer like that, wouldn't want to be treated by a Western doctor who's just going to remove the tumor and any Mm -hmm. organ that it happens to be on. Um, There was very good reason. There was an argument all over the world in the 19th century that you're better off not going to a doctor, (laughs) that they do more harm than good. So there's a lot of ways to explain this. But you could see the same epidemics appearing in the United States. So diabetes, you I did this for the case for sugar. You can get hospital records in the U.S., like Massachusetts General, which is the primary hospital in Boston, going back to 1924, 1824, when it first opened. And they'll tell you, they'll go back to their inpatient records and tell you how many cases of diabetes they had. So, for instance, in the U.S. today, in the Veterans Administration hospitals, one in four patients have diabetes. In Mass General, until 1850, they had multiple, every other year they would have no cases. It would be like 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 2, 0, 0. And then 1850, it starts to slowly increase. Um, 1870s and 80s, it turns upward again. And this pretty much coincides with sugar goes from being a... um, expensive luxury in the beginning of the 19th century. And tastes great. Tastes great, but it's expensive and it's something that only wealthy people can really afford. And then the Industrial Revolution makes it ever cheaper and cheaper to refine. In the 1840s, you have the founding of the chocolate industry and the candy industry and the And the liquid sugars, the, the, the sodas. The sodas come in the 1870s and 80s. And you can see this explosion of diabetes in um, case in the hospital records. And by the early 1900s, there are physicians and public health authorities who are saying diabetes is becoming epidemic and sugar might be the reason why. Might be. Might. Well, that's all they can say, right? Sugar but is you found suspect. 600. Well, that's, this was a century later. Okay. <laughs> I'm talking the early 19th century. So, yeah, I mean, it's... Um, But the interesting thing, like I said, is the idea that you should go back in time. We've got an epidemic. I mean, we do it with COVID, right? Let's go find patient number one. Mm -hmm. But people don't do that with the diabetes and obesity epidemics. The assumption is... You did that. I did it. Um, Not with obesity, but you can do it with diabetes. Uh, That will be your next book, isn't it? Uh, diabetes will be yeah. my next book, yeah. And the whole diabetes story is interesting because it's beginning in 1971. Once we decided that dietary fat caused heart disease, so people who live with diabetes are at very high risk of heart disease. So in 1971, the American Diabetes Association decides they're going to tell patients with diabetes that they should eat very little fat, which means they should eat a lot of carbohydrates, 50, 60% of their calories from carbs. So now you're telling people that they should get the majority of their calories in their diet from the one macronutrient that they cannot metabolize safely without the use of pharmaceutical assistance. Yep. It's a little crazy. I mean, when you just... I was I interviewed a journalist who had, lives with type 1 diabetes for this story. And um, he said to me, you yeah, know, I was diagnosed and I was shocked. And my physician told me how I will have to eat now. And I said, well, wait, wait. Um, What you're telling me is that carbohydrates are a poison to me now. And insulin is the antidote. And so I should eat the poison and take take the the antidote. (laughs) Why don't I just not eat the poison? Quit that. And he said, well, you won't be able to sustain that. And then he said, well, why don't you let me decide? <laughs> you know, but it, there's just this, I had this as an epigraph to the book, and then I thought, you know, I can't have it as the epigraph because I'm giving, there's no reason to read the book after you've read his logic. Um, it's a logic for my dad, so I, I'm very involved in this story. Because yeah. this is this is the story of so many people 
who you love a lot from. Yeah, and, yeah. and it's so difficult to convince them because the general idea is the story you tell. Well, and that's the thing. So the idea is you're saying I shouldn't eat the potatoes, no sweets, but I can eat butter and bacon. Yeah. And are you we, crazy? We've been, yeah, we've been trained to believe that butter and bacon are going to kill us. Now they're bad for the planet too, but it, you yeah. know, until 10 years ago, it was just bad for your health. So the tragedy becomes a kind of ironic, humorous tragedy in a tragic kind of way because the one, so the logic here ultimately is simple. Carbo, for those of us who fatten easily and who can't control our blood sugar, um, carbohydrates are the problem. And it's mediated through this hormone insulin. And so carbohydrates are fattening for us, you know, not for the Kenyan marathon runner. He's fine, but we're not, you know, not for the Tour de France riders. They can handle these carbs, but we can't. So we shouldn't eat them. They're poison to us. Rather than eating them and taking the antidotes, which if you don't become diabetic, become your statins, your blood pressure lowering medications, you're you know, dealing with the symptoms of this carbohydrate intolerance, why not just not eat them? It's not that hard, but then you have to eat foods that you've been told will kill you. Yeah, and then then what what is tell you is count your calories. Oh. So that's also a big topic of you uh, in your books. Yeah. Uh, is a calorie of sugar the same as a calorie in broccoli, for example? Well, it's worse than that because, I mean, if you phrase it like that, everyone would say, of course not, but the calorie is a calorie. So, of course, some calories are different than other calories, but ultimately a calorie is a calorie. Um, the idea is, you know, we get fat because we consume too many calories. So, you might... And I suggest this, and I do this exercise on why we get fat and suggest in the case for keto, a natural thing for any scientist to ask is, what size of an effect are we worrying about? Especially if you're going to test it experimentally, you have to know what size of an effect you expect to see, because that's what you have to have equipment that can detect an effect. So you can ask the question, how calories is to how accurately do I have to match intake to expenditure to not get fat so let's say I don't want to gain 20 pounds every 10 years because if I gain 20 pounds in a decade that's 40 pounds in two decades that's going from being nice and lean and athletic when I graduate from college to being obese in my early 40s I don't want that to happen how many excess calories is that? So, and it's this insanely simple calculation because 20 pounds in a decade is two pounds of fat a year, and a pound of fat is roughly 3,500 calories. So you've got 7,000 calories distributed over 365 days. It comes out to, when you run the numbers, it's like 20 calories a day. So that means if you store 20 calories, 20 calories. so that's okay. the equivalent. I thought of like, you should come on 2,000 calories. Yeah, no, that's 20, <laughs> okay. 20. So that's like two olives. It's, you know, it's four almonds. Perhaps it's, an egg? No. No, no, an egg is <laughs> an egg is 80 calories. Uh, a strip of bacon is 80 calories. Okay. So it's a quarter of a strip of bacon. Um, you know, a quarter of an egg. Uh, the one way to think about it is your best friend in high school kept her figure to adulthood and everyone and she's so slender and athletic and so impressive and you've struggled and you've gained 40 pounds okay the difference is you stored 20 calories of fat every day that she didn't 20 calories okay two olives <laughs> so that's if you're eating 2,000 calories a day that's one one hundredth of the food you're eating that gets stored and I first saw this calculation done in 1924 in a textbook called Basal Metabolism and Health and Disease. It was written by this fellow, Eugene Dubois, who was a leading metabolism expert in the U.S. And he did the calculation to say, this is crazy. There must be some other way people maintain their weight because this is impossible. Nobody, we don't know, we, nobody can count calories. The Guinness World Record expert on calorie counting can't get it right to 20 a day. And nobody knows how much they're expending. You know, even when you get, go to the gym and you get on the ergometer and, or whatever and it shows you your calories, that's an estimate because it doesn't know how much you weigh. 
Um, so there's, it's crazy that anyone, not that anyone would get fat, but how does anyone avoid it? And But it's so shocking that we are so on the wrong track. Yeah, but nobody cares. The, fact, the problem is I could go through this. Nobody cares. They had the but you, a simple you calculation. You people you love. You care about it. And there's yeah, so yeah, many yeah. people you love who are obese or bad health. And so who is not caring? Is it that well, the science? The, the, the experts are the authorities who are telling you to eat less and exercise more and to count your calories and all that. They, if you were to, when you start doing the kind of work I do, do you know what the, the concept of cognitive dissonance? Explain me. Cognitive Enlighten dissonance me. is... Um, basically what happens when you try to hold two incompatible beliefs in your head simultaneously. So one belief is people get fat because they eat too much. And now I'm going to give you the incompatible belief, which is, oh, wait a minute, eating too much is only 20 calories a day. See, 10 calories a day, you're still getting fatter by a pound a year every year. You're still going to get obese over 30 years instead of 20. So if you want, don't want to be obese, you have to pat perfectly match it and because that's incompatible with the belief that people get fat because they eat too much, they simply, the cognitive dissonance between these two ideas, and there's a science of cognitive dissonance that I had to study and learn, people's brains work to rationalize away cognitive dissonance. There's a very small percentage of the population will say, well, if I'm confronted with two incompatible beliefs, Maybe my belief system is, incom is it incorrect and I should re-examine all of it. And we started out talking about that with the obesity diabetes epidemic. But most people just learn not to look at one of the beliefs. Whichever the newest one usually is the one that you just learn to... And when I'm dealing with the researchers in these fields, and for 10 years I helped run a not-for-profit to fund research that I founded with Peter Atia, who was a... And you'd deal with the research and you'd ask them these kind of questions and you'd get this response where they'd go, and you should describe it as like the cognitive dissonance look. Mm. And then they'd say, let me get back to you on that. And they never would because as soon as they got out of your sight, basically they could kind of forget that you ever had this conversation. So that's one of the examples. If you're going to believe that obesity is caused by eating too much, how does anyone avoid it? In a world in which, and I have a quote from Russell Wilder, the leading obesity authority at the Mayo Clinic in the U.S. in 1937, who said, you know, all of the artistry of cooking and wine and alcohol and cocktails and desserts is designed to make us eat more calories than we otherwise would. How does anyone avoid getting fat? Anyone. It's not the question isn't why do some people get fat, but why does anyone? Why doesn't everyone? So, because this isn't what regulates fat accumulation. Fat accumulation is regulated hormonally, enzymatically. The central nervous system's involved, but it's, it's independent of how much we eat and exercise. And then um, if we follow that line that it's, that it's uh, a hormone um, uh, thing, um, can you... Um, do something as a person to control that or do something um, to it because everybody don't want to get fat. So, well, so yeah, so that's the thing. The um, Because then it becomes so complex. Well, it doesn't. It, complexity depends on what question you ask. Okay. So the link to diet goes through insulin. There are a lot of hormones and a lot of reasons why people can become fat and hormones that can be dysregulated, but the link to diet goes through the hormone insulin. And the little bit, there's a insulin part of a system with glucagon that works opposite it. But it's a totally chemistry thing, you know, that you have to learn that so much that you think, okay, what do I have to eat then? Well, but again, the insulin is responding to the carbohydrates in the diet. So, so it comes down that. to carbohydrates are fattening. To those of us who struggle with our weight, carbohydrates are fattening. We can't eat them. 
And they're always fattening. So you could go off them for a year, lose 50 pounds. If you go back to eating carbohydrates, they will continue to be fattening and you will gain the diet back. So one of the problems with, like over the years, scientists, researchers have developed diets based on this idea that insulin regulates fat storage. And if you want to minimize fat storage, you have to minimize insulin. The way you minimize insulin is by minimizing carbs. But they also fed people calorie restricted diet. So what they learned is they fed them an 800 calorie diet that was only fat and protein. They could lose weight effortlessly and not be hungry. But then the problem is what happened when they lost their weight. They had to feed them more. So you couldn't feed them the fat protein and add carbohydrates because carbohydrates are fattening. (laughs) That'll make them fat again. So what you could do is give them protein, fat, and more fat. But now you're feeding them the Atkins diet, and Atkins is supposed to kill people. Because of the heart disease. Because of the fat and the heart disease. So they rather, and then the alternative is you could give them appetite suppressant drugs so that they're, they can live on an 800 calorie diet, but nobody wants to give somebody appetite suppressant drugs for a lifetime. So these researchers just left the field. They said, we can't put them on Atkins, because that's unethical. We can't give them drugs, that's unethical. So now that we took 50 pounds off them and we published our paper about how well this works, we're out of here. But we can't continue their whole life. They can't continue their whole life. But the problem is you can continue your whole life. And the Atkins diet, keto, is just don't eat the potatoes. I mean, ultimately, don't have the potatoes, don't have the bread. Oh. Yeah, but more on an extreme way. Huh? So really kill them almost all. Also, the carbohydrates, what is in, for example, uh, in, in vegetables, if there is too much well, there's, sugar? Or no, or? there's very little carbohydrates in green leafy vegetables. So in the early years of nutrition science in the 20th century, they used to rate carbohydrate foods by percentage. So we had 20% vegetables, which were like potatoes, and that 20% of the weight was carbohydrates, and 10% foods that were, I don't know, legumes and nuts, and 5% carbs, which were broccoli and green leafy vegetables. So you can have a whole cup of green leafy vegetables, and it's the equivalent of like 20 calories of carbs. And it takes a while to digest. The technical term is slow glycemic index because it's bound up with the fiber. So in effect, the diet becomes... I mean, I used to say as an example, so I started writing about this when I lived in New York. And in New York City, we have kitchens that are about half the size of this table, so we tend not to cook. And so, and I was a journalist who worked at home, so I wanted to get out. So I'd eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner out. So breakfast... That goes well? It worked for me. Okay. Um, the, uh, you know, it wasn't gourmet restaurants, but the breakfast was at the local diner. It was eggs and bacon, and I had to worry about okay. the eggs and bacon because that's going to kill me, right? That's the heart disease. That's. But lunch, I'd go to a local French cafe. I'd order a half a roast chicken and tell them, hold the potatoes, give me a double order of vegetables, put some olive oil on the vegetables. Um, dinner could be the same thing, fish, steak, Give me the fish, hold the potatoes, double order vegetables. Very easy to do. Technically, it's keto. Yep. But all I'm doing is not eating the potatoes. And I'm actually getting more vegetables than ever because I'm asking for a double order. My mother would have been delighted had she not finally passed. Finally, yeah. <laughs> had she not passed away. Carrie from eats his vegetables. Yeah. Now we always ate our vegetables. Okay. He couldn't make Brussels sprouts to save her life, but everything else was. But so it's. You know, people pitch it as diet. One of the problems is uh, physicians come along like Atkins and they rediscover this for themselves. And then they want to tell people. I don't actually think they think I'm going to write a book and get rich. They just want to tell people what they've learned because they see that it works for them and it works for their patients. So they write books and then they give it a name. So it's, you know, the Atkins diet or the protein power or... People want guidelines. People want guidelines. It's true. I write books that <laughs> you know, they explain all of this and they give no advice at all. And people are done like, well, what do I eat? Yes. Should be obvious. 
<laughs> Isn't it obvious? Give, Give me a list. <laughs> So, but anyway, it all gets confused. And is, am I supposed to do Atkins? Am I supposed to do keto? If I do keto, do I have to have a bulletproof coffee every day with <laughs> MCT oil? And is it not keto if I don't have that? And it's like, don't eat the potatoes. Keep it simple. That is really yeah, your message. That's the, and if, by potatoes, I mean don't eat the, the, the sugar, the, the grains, the starches. You can have green leafy vegetables. And the drinks? Um, An important thing, I... You know, beer is, beer is a problem. There are the low-carb beers. Um, you know, the way I think about it, I, I have friends who are, you know, women of a certain age who have trouble losing weight on these Men diets. also, I think. M more, I would have thought more so than men, although when I interviewed a, over 100 physicians for that book, many of them said that it didn't matter, but I... My understanding women as they get older have more problems losing weight but my female friends also had more problems not drinking three glasses of wine every night <laughs> when they stopped drinking the three glasses of wine every night suddenly it was easier so red wine is relatively benign because it doesn't have high sugar content like white wine um, but you know in the ideal world the way I think of it is and I was a smoker, okay, a cigarette smoker, and it was, um, you can't do quit smoking by going to moderation or anything like that. Eventually, you have to go through cold turkey and be miserable for a couple months, and then eventually you get to the point where you can't imagine why you ever smoked, but it could be several years, and then you feel healthier, and so... You know, I think, why not just abstain? Like, do you really, if you can't go without wine for two months, you've got a problem that may be worse <laughs> than your weight. Um, but that's a big thing for a lot of people. Yeah, no, here, I, see, I, even I feel like I'm being socially unacceptable if I don't have wine. Yeah, in yeah, in the Netherlands, I don't drink alcohol, but it's a big thing. Yeah, no, it's, uh, but if, what I would say is if you, try to do this don't eat the carbohydrates thing except for green vegetables um and it's not working then i would try to do it without the wine and you know and then if it works let's say you're 30 pounds overweight the natural thing for a 40 year old or 50 year old to have happen is to lose 25 to 30 pounds pretty easily now you could decide you could add back the wine and see what happens so lose the weight, go back to drink the wine. If the weight starts to come back, you could say to yourself, is it worth it? Yeah. You know, but now you know what the trade-off is. Yeah. Yeah. If you never do it, you never know what yeah. the trade-off is. I describe in the case for keto, there was a study at Stanford that my not-for-profit partially funded, and which put people on a low-carb diet and a low-fat diet, but then they told the people on a low-carb diet they could add carbs back after a couple months. So I was in a conference in Aspen, Colorado. Nice. Um, makes me want to be a billionaire when I live in Aspen. Um, the, uh, so I'm sitting next to a woman in the conference who's uh, living with uh, obesity, and she's uh, an accountant. The Stanford educated accountant who had told me she had been in this study and she weighs around 230 pounds. Oh. And she was randomized to eat and affect the keto diet. And she lost 30 pounds in the first three months. And then they said, You can add some carbs back if you miss them. So she added back fruit she missed. And in the next three months, she lost five pounds. And then they said you could add more carbs back, and she added back some more fruit, and that, that was the last weight she lost. So in total, she lost 235 pounds, so she was now down to a little under 200, which wasn't that different than being 230. And so it wasn't really worth it to her, the trade-off. So then mm -hmm. she slowly went back to eating as she always had. Um, had she not added the fruit back, that 30-pound weight loss may have continued. She might have gotten down to 130 or 140 pounds. You don't know, but it's possible. And at 130 pounds, like a truly, you know, like being lean for the first time in her life since she was 11 years old, she might have decided that she didn't need fruit. Yeah. You know, it wasn't worth it. But yeah. she never got the chance to find out. 
because they suggested that she yeah. had the fruit back before, you know, when the weight loss was still was significant by medical standards, but it wasn't significant enough to really change her life or the burden of her excess weight. And, you know, what I'm trying to do in my book is say, is to give, to teach people how to think about it so that they can say to themselves, maybe it's worth sacrificing for six months to see what happens, what my body's like, how it works, how I function, how I feel about how I function, and if I decide it's not worth it. Like many people, you know, you still don't like your spouse and your job still sucks and you're still miserable and now you can't even have a donut. Like that's insane. So, or a beer after work, so I'm gonna go back to the, but other people are gonna feel like, hey, I'm finally, my body works like my thin friends. I like the way I look. I can go <laughs> running for the first time in my life. It's like it's worth the trade-off. For some people, it will be for some. Won't. Yeah. But if you don't do it, you'll never find out. And then the last topic. Uh, I hear a few podcasts from you that you also uh, mentioned that it's... Uh, because if you um, cut out the, the um, carbs and uh, uh, raise the fats, then you also raise the proteins... Uh, and then you come on the discussion of uh, eating meat or not. Yeah. That's well, also so confusing. Um, you know, it's inter the, uh, it is confusing. Um, so the saying in sort of medical circles for 200 years has always been, you are what you eat. And Eric Westman, this physician at Duke University, who's here in Amsterdam today for the Ancestral Health Symposium tomorrow, who did one of the earliest studies of the Atkins diet, Eric likes to say you should eat what you are. And what we are is fat and protein. Animal products are fat and protein with a tiny little bit of carbohydrate stored in the muscle as glycogen. So it's like 95% fat and protein. And if you eat what you are, your body, that's what we evolve to do. So, and it's much easier if you can avoid carbs. You can do it in a vegan or vegetarian lifestyle, but it's very complex. It's the plants are carbohydrate, so it's primarily so it's much harder, much more difficult, and arguably it may not be as healthy for us. It's certainly more difficult to make a vegan diet, you know, healthful than it is. You can't just sit down and have eggs and bacon. Yeah. You know, where you're just so but now we're animal livestock is considered a major contributor of climate change. I don't know what to make of that science. I've been trained to be skeptical and my experience is whenever there's a politically correct answer to something, you should be very skeptical when that's what the researchers are getting. Um, it's a complex issue. It's the idea that we should eat mostly plants. So people argue we should eat mostly plants for the environment but eating mostly plants for ourselves is clearly the healthiest thing to do also. So it's a win-win, and they could tell us we have to eat a healthy plant for the environment because that's going to make us healthier also. That, I think, is very questionable. So even if the animal livestock issue is correct, it may be that a significant proportion of the population, those of us who fatten easily, who, you know, um, need animal products, in our diet, and maybe a significant amount of it to be healthy. And the way it where it really comes to a head is if you think about, um, you know, a mother making decisions about for her child. So let's say the mother, is, the parents are vegetarians or vegans for the good of the environment, but their child struggles with obesity. Do they have a moral obligation to feed their diet, their child, the diet that's going to make that child healthiest, or to feed the child the diet that's best for the environment? Yeah, it's complex. It's complex. And the way it's communicated to us by the media, it's not. No. And we need much more thoughtful discussion about this. Yeah, and we need you, Gary, to guide us. Thank you so much for this uh, beautiful uh, information you share with us. and. Uh, to the audience, buy your books. It's really a great help in Thank this you, dark wood. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a sad state of affairs when people have to take diet advice from a journalist. <laughs> yeah, but that's where we are. But that's where we are. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. Thank you.
Kijk jij ook graag naar onze uitzendingen? Vergeet je dan niet te abonneren op ons kanaal. Bedankt voor het kijken en tot ziens!